Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another very exciting episode right here on the My Gardener channel. In today's episode, I am very, very excited to be doing a harvest video. I thought we'd just kind of take the opportunity to kind of change the pace up a little bit, slow things down, and to do a harvest video because we've been doing a ton of different how-tos, ton of tutorials, and we in the background, we've had this squash growing. And the squash is really important to me. It's very near and dear to my heart. And it's something that uh, I really wanted to kind of showcase because well, they're ready to harvest. And so I kind of wanted to not only harvest them, because it's gonna be crazy, it's gonna be really amazing from what I've seen, but also I wanna tell you a little bit more about this squash, how we got it, and uh, why it's so near and dear to my heart. So this variety of squash is a winter squash, and it's come to be called butternut for good reason. Now it started out as a butternut squash with a mutation, and check this out. This is all usable meat right here. And that's what's really cool about it is it has all of the flavor, all of the usability of a butternut squash with very little waste. This is actually the seed cavity right here. And a lot of times with butternut squashes, it's hard when you're trying to go through the contours of the squash to make it usable. So this right here makes it so much more desirable to harvest and to, uh, to use. You can still use the meat around the seed cavity as well, but most of this is, uh, most of this is usable. Now, these are ripe when they turn nice and creamy in color, and so we're gonna be harvesting these squash today. And I wanna tell you a little bit more because we got a ton here to harvest. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about this squash and why it's so important to me. So the reason why this variety is so important to me is because of the fact that this is one of our very first kind of homegrown heirloom varieties. Now, you know that we talk all the time about how important heirlooms are to the gardening community and why they're really important to the agricultural world in general. But uh, this variety is especially important to me because this is one of the very first heirlooms that I'm actually stabilizing and kind of working on myself. This started about four years ago from squash seed that we got from, uh, from a, uh, a uh, Amish farmer. Um, my family lived up in Amish country for a super long time and there was, uh, he had a produce stand setting out and uh, he had basically grown this beautiful butternut squash. It was gorgeous. Um, and the butternut squash was like a standard butternut squash. And so I took seeds from that because it tasted so good that I thought I'd grow it out the next year. And so that's how every heirloom starts is basically by growing out a variety. And if you find something that you like about it, that you continue to preserve that variety. Well, something happened when I grew out those varieties that I had a bunch of butternut squash, but one of the plants, one of the plants, I had about seven or eight plants that I was growing that year, and one of those plants had an incredibly long neck on it, incredibly long. And it was not like the butternut squash, obviously, that I had planted. It was something totally unique and new. It was some mutation or a cross of some sort. But the crazy thing was, it tasted twice as good as the butternut that I thought tasted amazing. It was one of the best butternuts that I had uh, that I'd come across. And so not only did it taste even better, but the crazy thing was how usable it was. I mean, look, look, look at this. This is all usable here. You just take a carrot peeler, peel all the skin off, dice it up, and you're instantly ready to go. This is as much meat as you'd get from a butternut squash, but with half or even more than half of the time saved in prepping it. So absolutely, incredible. And because the seed cavity is so small, you get way less seed than you would on a normal on a normal squash. So seeds are very, very scarce. Now, when I grew that out, I knew that I was onto something special because um, there's lots of different varieties of kind of long necked winter squash that exist out there, but nothing lasted as long. These lasted well into January. So we harvested them in about October, but they lasted until about January very nice long shelf life. The, the flesh on them was buttery, creamy, and orange. It was super beautiful, just like a butternut squash. But like I said, way more orange and way more flavorful. And then to top it all off, the fact that I was able to you know harvest more of it and enjoy more of it made it so superior. And so I found that that butternut squash was actually what I wanted to be growing. Now, the other thing that I found was it's incredible disease resistance. It really surprised me because though we're starting to just get a little bit of powdery mildew now, it's nothing 
compared to some of our other squash that we have. And you can just see in here, look at this. Check this out, look at this down here. The, the squash are still producing. There's still a little squash that will not come to fruition, but all these squash in here, you still have more squash. I'll leave these on, I'm not gonna pull them off. They may, who knows. But these ones here that are ripe, I'm gonna pull off. And these just look absolutely incredible. But the plants also are very disease resistant. Hardly any powdery mildew. And they're growing in some really thick weeds and some brush back here by the, by the fence. And there's nothing that's affecting them. So once I realized I was onto something and everyone around me loved this squash, I realized that I needed to take the next step, which was turning it into an heirloom. But how does one turn it into an heirloom? Well, it's not an easy process. Well, it is easy, it just takes a long time and a lot of patience. But the first thing that I needed to do was to start stabilizing the genetics. And that takes a long time. So the process of stabilizing things out, like I said, is not hard, it just takes a long time many, many years of selecting what you want and discarding what you don't. And so the first year I saved seeds from that, uh, that single plant of the 12 that I was growing. I saved one, basically one plant's worth of fruits. So it was about four or five fruits. I took all those seeds and I dried them. I put some in cold storage for a future year in case something happened. And I planted some out the next year. I planted about 14 plants out. Of those 14 plants, I got about 50% of those plants to show signs of the butternut. The other 50%, well, they actually reverted back to the butternut. And that's because genes are actually known as sticky. They want to revert back to their parent as much as possible. Whatever those uh, dominant genes were uh, at the time, those dominant genes want to uh, kind, of, kind of shine through, if you will. And so they said, I don't want to be a butternut. I want to be a butternut. And so uh, about 50% of those plants were the butternut, or the butternut, I should say, and then the other 50% were the butternut. Then what I did was I selected the butternut again, and I said, nope, I want you, I don't want the butternut. And so I saved the seeds from the uh, butternut squash, and I grew it out a third year. The third year was actually a wash. I had uh, no fruits that, that actually were, um, that were stable because the plants all died. And so everything was a wash that year. But luckily, like any good seed saver, I had seeds in storage. And because I had seeds in storage the fourth year, I grew them out. So I basically started right where I left off and I took my then F2, F2 is just the generation, my second generation, and I got about 75% of the fruits to be the butternut. We're getting less and less of the gene, that dominant butternut gene to shine through. And we're getting more and more of this long necked, small seed cavityed, um, interesting looking squash. Um, <laughs> and um, then I took the F3, the third generation. I saved the 75%, discarded the other ones I didn't want, and I kept growing it out. And slowly, we're now on the sixth year of growing this out. We are at a point where we are near 100%. I'll show you uh, basically the, the largest reversion or the largest slippage, right? Slippage is where it wants to go back to the parent. The largest slippage we have from this year's crop is one that I already picked. So we just went and harvested all, or what we thought to be all of the butternut squash. There's probably still a couple hidden in amongst the weeds and stuff. After the first killing frost, I'll go through, I'll pull up all the plants and we'll probably still find a couple. And there may be a couple more plants or a couple more fruits, I should say, that will ripen up. But assuming we got them all, this is this year's haul from just seven plants. I am very, very happy with this year's haul. Despite the growing conditions, despite you know, how cold it was, how wet it was, and how dry the spring was, everything has grown very, very well and produced very well. So now we are basically at the point where we are going to select out what we want to grow for next year for seed stock. And this is, I think, the learning lesson that I can teach all of you because a lot of you write in saying, I have a unique variety, I have a family heirloom or a family uh, tomato that everyone loves, and I want to keep growing it out. How do I ensure that it's gonna stay stable? How do I ensure that I'm going to uh, create a nice heirloom for people to enjoy? And this is what you do. So, like I said, the original fruit that I harvested from was a butternut squash. And that's what I thought I was gonna be getting, but then I got some unique, uh, either a mutation or a cross of some sort, 
and that's what I wanted to save. So what I'm looking for is I'm looking for traits that are kind of dominant for a butternut squash. And dominant would be things that kind of stick out to me, right? The large seed cavity. So in amongst all these squash here, you know what, coming in close here, um, and we can look at all these squash, we can kind of pick out the, the, the largest seed cavity, we can discard those because I don't want a large seed cavity. I want a small seed cavity. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna select out all of the squash that have a large seed cavity. So this right here, got a nice neck to it, but the seed cavity is really, really large in proportion to the neck. So despite this one being pretty, I'm going to set this one aside. I also have here, this one is shorter. Butternut, butternut squash are shorter in size, but a really large seed cavity. Not good proportions on this one. This is still definitely, even though it's more butternut than it is butternut, uh, it's still showing some signs of the butternut squash. So I'm gonna discard this one. We'll eat those ones. Coming over here, here's another one. I'm guessing these are probably mostly from the same plant. Same thing, short neck, pretty large seed cavity. I'm gonna discard those. Then we're getting into what I consider to be the, 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 next, uh, the next selection here, which is short, right? Butternut squash are short and stumpy. So good seed cavity, small seed cavity, but stumpy size. We're gonna eat that one. Then we have here, this one is probably just bent. I don't think this bend is really characteristic necessarily. I think if it was growing on a trellis, it'd be totally straight like these ones are, but we're still pretty short, right? I wanna get a nice long neck. I wanna encourage a nice long neck. So uh, I'm gonna discard this one. It's not the worst, but it's definitely not the best. Coming over here, um, more short ones. Here's another kind of short one. I'm gonna, I'm, this one is really nice in terms of the proportion of seed cavity to neck, but it's shorter. I wanna encourage that nice long yielding neck. So we're gonna discard that. Then we have here another short one, right? I'm just kind of using these as a metric. Discard that. Here's another short one. Great proportions, this is beautiful, but we're gonna discard that. Plus this would not really yield a whole lot of seeds. Um, this one is a little underripe, so I'm gonna discard that one just because. Now we have here what I consider to be the best of the best. So now I can look at here, I can look at my traits and I can see what I wanna select out because I'm only gonna select about two fruits, believe it or not, from that entire harvest, about two fruits. That's about it. Maybe three at most. And so I like the length of this one. I think it has really good proportions. So I'm gonna say, if this was dodgeball, I'm gonna pick you. This has a really long neck, super small seed cavity. I think that one's terrific. And then it's a toss up. These are about the same. And sometimes they're all they're gonna have some variation. This one, get rid of this one. This one's a little wider, this one's a little longer. Um, there's gonna be gifts on the line of this, I guarantee you. Um, but I'm going to probably pick that one. And so then, this one here has a really bulbous seed cavity. I think this one's still showing some signs. Maybe not, you know, it could be. I think, I think it's safe to say that these three are the ones I'm gonna save seeds from. And over time, you know, hopefully by next year, we're gonna have seeds that we can save and grow out and actually um, have stable, stable genetics. I ultimately want them all to look about this way here. I really don't want any reversion back. You can see the difference. Right, you can see the butternut squash coming out in this. And you can see the butternut squash coming out in this. It's very obvious when you put it up next to each other. The ones, you know, the butternut, butternut size, butternut seed cavity, butternut. I want these. And as uh, they say in Pokemon, I choose you. So that's the thought process behind what I do when I'm kind of selecting out the genetics that I like. And this is how all of the varieties that we have come to know and love today have come about. Um, you know, there's no engineering to the genes. I'm not putting a fish gene in to a, to a squash to get this characteristic, right? Like this is how nature would have intended, open pollinated, right? You're getting a pollen from some other squash, maybe a banana squash. Some people suggested that maybe it was a banana squash that pollinated with a butternut. And that's very possible. I could totally see a banana in some of these, uh, the banana squash. I mean, it's very, very evident in some of these ones. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, that's, that's the nature of what, what is going on here is you're getting, uh, you're getting pollen from different 
uh, different squash sources and they're cross pollinating and um, they are uh, mixing and then you're finding unique new varieties that are absolutely amazing. And so it takes time to get these to stabilize. It's not gonna be done overnight. It shouldn't be done overnight. But I will say, if you wanna take part in this process, um, we have some kind of what we consider to be our lesser seed stock. We have uh, a couple a couple um, farmers that are growing out butterneck for us as well, doing the same thing that we're doing. And basically, the ones that are fringe, um, we're taking all of the fringe squash, saving seeds from the ones that are really good, just not like, like A tier squash. And we're saving the seeds from those so that you yourself can also grow out the butterneck squash kind of see if you can uh, breed out some of those genetics. And they're available over at migardener.com in limited quantities. Now, um, just keep checking back. We're gonna be putting some seeds back in stock for 2024. When you see this video, those seeds will not be on the website yet. But if you wanna take place, uh, take a part in this uh, unique seed saving project, um, definitely go over there and check it out. The ones that are definite no's, we're just gonna eat these and not save seeds from. But the ones that I, like I said, are fringe, we're still gonna save seeds from these because they do still have a lot of those, uh, those genes for the butterneck squash in there. And I would love for you to take part in this process in saving seeds, getting more seeds out there into more hands, and, um, and also learning and experiencing what it is to select those genetics. So if you're interested, go check it out. If not, just kind of follow along with the process. We're gonna take these three, we're gonna grow them out. And then from there, once we have almost 100% of our crops looking like this, we're going to then take all, because right now we're only taking three out of maybe, I don't know, 20 squash, but we're looking to take all 20 squash at some point, turn those all into seed, and then we can start mass production of the seed. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you all learned something new. If you did, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and if you have any questions about seed saving or heirlooms, post them in the comments box down below. I'd be happy to answer them. And as always, this is Luke from the MI Gardener channel, reminding you to grow bigger. Take care.